I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm Pooh. And I'm William Cooper. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, my dear. You're welcome. I'll come and tuck you in in just a little bit. All right. Good night. Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that great change is in the works. You can see it all around us. We have studied, we have researched, we have uncovered and exposed probably the greatest conspiracy in the history of the world, or at least it began as a conspiracy. Nothing is hidden anymore. But by the strict legal definition, it can be called a conspiracy. Through the use of common sense and study, however, everything is out in the open. Nothing is hidden. The people who are bringing about this change in the world are so arrogant, so convinced that we, the ordinary man and woman, are so stupid, so ignorant, and so concerned with our day-to-day -day life and earning a living and sucking up some suds after work down at the local tavern are just in front of your television, rotting your brain, that they don't bother to hide anything anymore. They are absolutely convinced that it has gone so far that nothing can stop it. And the more time that passes, you can see their arrogance increase, their contempt for the rest of us grows beyond any normal bound. We know that they want to create one world. One world. Where there will be no more sovereign nation states, nor sovereign people. They want to disarm every person in every country. They want to create a system of regions under a world totalitarian socialist government. They want to, quote, enslave the masses, end quote, or at least bind them so that they will never again represent a threat to the ruling class. We know from their own writings and speeches and documents that they want to call the population of the world and bring down to a much more manageable level. We also know that religion has been a big thorn in their side since the beginning. And they want to do away with all existing religions save theirs. But what is theirs? What is this religion of theirs that we're going to be forced to join or suffer dire consequences if we choose not to? And everyone will be given a choice. If we study the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, we can see that there is only one religion that has ever been recognized in the history of that organization. And that religion is the Baha'i faith, or Baha'ism, as some call it. Tonight I'm going to take you on a tour of the Baha'i faith and give you a peek into what has to be 
a merging of all of the mystery religions into a accepted body of teachings and beliefs that these manipulators believe will allow all the people in the world to live together without any conflict. And as I go through this, I think you'll begin to understand why. <laughs> there is no concept of freedom in the New World Order. Understand, ladies and gentlemen, that you will be presented with a strict set of rules on how you will live your life. You will have to have permission to have children. The children will be reared by the state, not by the family. You will only probably be forced to work four hours a day and be pleasantly entertained with Super Bowls and great sporting contests and fantastic exhibitions and motion pictures and holographic presentations and theatrical works. Great art exhibitions, designer drugs, parties. And as you have already noticed on television, gladiators are coming back. Although in its present form, blood has not been spilled as of yet. However, it is extremely popular with the less intelligent of what they call the masses. Watch it flower and bloom until one day you will watch to come back and up on a field in front of tens of thousands of people battle to the death once again. And they may be those who choose not to follow the New World religion. A person who really wants to know what's coming in the New World Order will be an avid student of the old Roman Empire. You will be amazed at the similarities and even the exact duplicity of the politics, the lies, the manipulation of the people and of the Republic and the same ruses that were used in Julius Caesar's day, to destroy the Republic and create a dictatorship ruled by an emperor who ultimately became God, are being played out on the world stage today. The exact scenario. You will even see the exact symbols in use. The next time you're watching C-SPAN, look on each side of the podium where the speaker sits. You will see the fascia. <laughs> and you see the eagle. And if you look upon the lodges of the Scottish Rite Temple, you will see the double-headed eagle. It's all there. It's all the same religion, the same politics, the same lies, the same manipulations, the same controls, the same power struggles, the same greed, the same desire, the same frantic temptations to rule the world by the same people descended from the exact same families. Doubt it not. Dr. E. Stanley Jones wrote, There is a snag in the statement of the Theosophists 
and the Baha'is that all religions are basically one and the same and are equally good, therefore join the Theosophical Society, are the Baha'is on that basis. But if they are all the same, why another? It would indeed seem superfluous, yet Baha'is report a much stronger response from the public during recent years than ever before. <laughs> and maybe Ferguson was right when he stated that no cult bears a gospel better suited to the temper of our times than the Baha'i. <laughs> you will soon discover why. You see, this movement, which after all claims only something over one million adherents in nearly every country of the world, is worth studying. For among those one million adherents, and I sincerely, ladies and gentlemen, believe that it is way beyond that number, are the great families that control the financial systems, economies, banks, the families that rule the nations of the world. Dr. Atkins was right in observing that there is among all the cults nothing more curious than that the old controversy as to the true successor of Muhammad, the prophet, should at last have issued and a universal religion with a temple of unity on the shores of Lake Michigan. You see, Baha'ism is of Persian Mohammedan origin. It traces its beginning to the Mohammedan belief that the last true successor of Muhammad, who disappeared in the 10th century, never died, but is still living in a mysterious city surrounded by a band of faithful disciples and that at the end of time he will issue forth and fill the earth with justice after it has been filled with iniquity. This hidden successor, ladies and gentlemen, is said to have revealed himself from time to time through those to whom he has made known his will and who are known as Babs, our gates. The gate that is, whereby communication was reopened between the Hidden One and His faithful followers. The last one of these Babs was a young Persian merchant named Mirza Ali Muhammad, who took the title of Bab in 1844, and who had much the same relation to Baha'u'llah as John the Baptist had to Christ. You see, the Bab's career was short-lived. He died a martyr's death at the hand of Persian Mohammedans at the age of 30 years in the year 1850. He had constantly pointed to a divine prophet who was shortly to succeed him. The same old promise of a Messiah that has existed for millennia. And before his death, he sent his signet rings and writings to one of his friends and foremost supporters, one Mirza Hussein Ali, his senior by only two years. The two had never met and were certainly not related. Ali at first continued the teachings of the Bab, but soon afterwards announced himself as the divine manifestation predicted by him. <laughs> an opportunist, you might say. He is known as Baha'u'llah, that is, translated, glory to God. The followers of this organization then changed their name from Babs to Baha'is and proceeded to ascribe to Baha'u'llah divine honor and worship. Like the Bab, Baha'u'llah and his disciples suffered much from persecution and exile, which, of course, only proved once more that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Baha'u'llah passed away in May of 1892, at the age of 75, after 40 years of hardship, imprisonment, and exile in his villa 
of Beje near Akka in Palestine, also known as the Holy Land. He was succeeded by his son, Abbas Effendi, born in Tehran, Persia, on May 23rd, in 1844. Coincidentally, on the very day upon which the Bab made his declaration to the disciples in Shiraz, Abbas, who had shared his father's hardships as well as his greater ease in his declining years, is known among the Baha'is as Abdul Baha, in effect, translated, the servant of God. He became the authoritative interpreter of the teachings of the Master, Baha'u'llah. He, too, became the victim of persecution and has known adversities and persecutions, although not as severe or numerous as his predecessors in the cause. In 1912, he actually visited the United States where the first disciples were one in Chicago and where the cause has since grown more rapidly than in any other country except Persia. Abdul Baha died on November the 28th, 1921, aged 77 years. The leadership of the movement, after some wranglings, fell to his eldest grandson, Shoghi Effendi, the head of a committee of 19, and known by the title of Guardian of the Cause. Baha'ism is the unifying cult par excellence. If there is any such thing as a cult, this certainly fits the current definition. It has, in the words of one Mrs. Chandler, accepted all the religions of the world, found them fundamentally and essentially alike, and reveres equally as divine all nine of the prophets. So it may appeal equally to Hindus, Muslims, Christians, and Jews. It admits the divinity of the prophet of Messiah of each. It does not even claim any greater divinity for its own particular prophet, Baha'u'llah. It merely claims that the great beauty of blessed perfection, coming later, has brought the latest message from the divine source to the peoples of the world, and that the message doesn't differ fundamentally or in essence from the message of his predecessor, but is, you might say, brought up to date in dealing with certain specific matters that did not concern the people whom Christ or Mohammed addressed. In the words of another Baha'i writer, Jesus could not speak of international problems as people did not know of the existence of Japan. A new revelation for our modern day must therefore complete that brought by Jesus. When Jesus warned to watch and pray for the coming of the Lord, he meant receive Baha'u'llah. <laughs> this prophet therefore referred to Jesus as the Son of God or a manifestation of God, but claimed to be himself a later manifestation. In accordance with these fundamental ideas, and to attain to their unifying ideal, Baha'is present the following principles for which they strive. Listen very carefully. The oneness of God and oneness of religion. The oneness of mankind. Independent search after truth. All prejudices must be abandoned to wit religious, color, national, class, sexual, and personal prejudices. International peace. International auxiliary language. An education for all. Equality for the sexes. Abolition of industrial slavery which is abolition of wealth and poverty, which translates to communistic. Personal holiness, work in the spirit of service, is worship. <laughs> oh boy. Now some of these sound really good, and some of them really are, ladies and gentlemen. 
Others are manipulations. And terrible manipulations at that. Baha'ism claims that unity and brotherhood are the only important things and not doctrine. You see, this faith comes out of the mysteries of the brotherhood of the Illuminati. And it is built around this word brotherhood. Love is the ever-recurring word in its literature. But those who practice this religion demonstrate over and over again that that word love means little, if anything at all. You see, its conception of love is neither correct nor consistently carried out. In the first place, Baha'ism itself proves that love without certain definite teachings is untenable. When in New York in 1912, Abdul Baha was approached by two Baha'is who, arguing a point of Baha'i teachings, asked him to decide who was right. The answer of Abdul Baha was, neither is right. To be a Baha'i, there must never be any discord. All must agree. Unity is the aim. And yet this same system now insists that nothing whatever should be given to the public by any individual among the friends unless fully considered and approved by the spiritual assembly in his locality. The implication of this, of course, is that it is not safe to let individuals air their views on Baha'i teaching except after official approval of their views. The Star of the West is the official organ of the movement in America. And in the next place, in case a member of the Baha'is leaves the movement because of changed views, he, or generally she, for this is a ladies' cult, like Christian science, has good reason to hide as far as possible out of reach of the leaders of this loving cult. Now, you can never find anything written that will back up that statement, ladies and gentlemen. But anyone who has been a victim of the aftermath of their public disagreement with the tenets of the Baha'i faith will tell you very quickly, without hesitation, and with great fear that it is true. You see, there is no salvation for apostate Baha'is according to the system, just as there is no salvation for apostate Mormons according to their system, just as there is no salvation for apostate Freemasons according to their system, or for apostate Rosai Krushai members according to their system. You would think that the frightfully outlandish names in use among Baha'is tend to make the movement unpopular. But the Baha'is, however, do not shrink from pointing to their great temple as Mashrigul Adhkar. And with this temple, they conjure. It has cost more money and time to complete this temple than seems to have been originally expected, and the dream of building similar structures in every state of the Union has, for the time being, at least, not materialized. Oh, they have built structures and temples here and there, but not in every state of the Union. The temple at Wilmette near Chicago embodies in visible form many of the ideals of this organization and is its chief means of propaganda. In an illustrated pamphlet on the Baha'i's House of Worship, 
and institution of the world order of Baha'u'llah, Guinevere El Coy informs us that as musicians, artists, and poets receive their inspiration from another realm, so the late Louis Bourgeois, architect of this temple, through all his years of labor, was ever conscious that the Baha'u'llah was the creator of this building to be erected to his glory. And when the man-made creeds are stripped away from all the religions, we find nothing left but harmony. But today, religion, ladies and gentlemen, is so entangled in the superstitions and hypotheses of men that it must needs be stated in a new form to be once again pure and undefiled according to the Baha'is. And according to the Baha'is, that is exactly what they and no one else are doing. And likewise, in architecture, those fundamental structural lines which originated in the faith of all religions are the same, but so covered over are they with the decorations picturing creed upon creed and superstition upon superstition that the Baha'is need lay them aside and create a new form or ornamentation. So into this new design, the design of the temple is woven in symbolic form the great Baha'i teaching of unity. Which symbology? Why, the symbology that I've been teaching you for the last four and a half years. The symbology of the ancient mystery religion of Babylon. The great Baha'i teaching outwardly to the profane, is that of unity. The unity of all religions and of all mankind. There are combinations of mathematical lines symbolizing those of the universe. And in their... Let's see if it doesn't sound a little familiar to you. The unity of all religions and of all mankind. Combinations of mathematical lines which symbolize those of the universe. And in the intricate merging of circle into circle, of circle within circle, we visualize the merging of all of the different religions into one. So I'm not going to belabor this and make you weary of listening to a detailed account of the cost that was spent. But when the Mashriqwil Adkar at Wilmet was completed. It was supposed to include a hospital and dispensary, a school for orphan children, a hospice, and a college for higher scientific education. In these institutions, the principle of the oneness of mankind was to have been put into concrete practice. The surfaces were to be dispensed irrespective of color, race, or nationality. The scientific college, we are told, was included because religion and science are the two wings upon which man's intelligence can soar into the heights with which the human soul can progress, whatever that means. You see, there are nine entrances into the Nanagan Temple. That's their term. I have no idea what nonagon means. Each one of these entrances represents one of nine great religions and all together, leading into the inner sanctuary of truth from the headquarters of the National Spiritual Assembly of Baha'is is the United States and Canada. We are also informed that when the interior decoration is completed, the central hall of the Wilmot Temple will be open for daily prayer and meditation and for meetings consisting only of reading from the words of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha. In all of these mystery schools, you will find... The, the object of central concern is the completion of a temple. The work on the Baha'i's great temple 
proceeded for many years very, very slowly. In a letter dated February the 21st, 1942, Mr. Horace Haley, Secretary of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Wilmette, Illinois, informed Since the pamphlet by Guinevere L. Coy was published, the work of external decoration has been carried forward to a point very near completion. The enclosed photograph, taken December 18th, shows the progress of the main story, which is now nearly completed, except for two of the nine sides. We hope that this work can be done before the fall of 1942. And it wasn't. And at the same time, construct the circular steps which are to surround the building. When this construction work is finished, the exterior of the building will be complete, but the work of the interior is still to be done. We do not plan any immediate work on the interior, but assume that after a few years, a definite scheme of interior decoration and arrangement will be undertaken. Now compare this slow financial sacrifice for the movement's chief enterprise, the remark of W. M. Miller. It is startling to read in the census statistics as given by the Baha'is of America that whereas the property of the Baha'i Temple in Chicago is worth more than a million dollars, the amount given in 1936 by the members of the cause to charity was only $281. Same thing happens with the Freemasons, who claim that they are a benevolent organization existing for the good of the community, and they collect millions and millions of dollars every year. Every research into what is done with those dollars reveals that less, ladies and gentlemen, less than 3% is ever spent on good works. So even if this figure of the Baha'is is correct, according to W.M. Miller, even if it is incorrect, wouldn't it be wonderful if they would show their love more in deed than in word, he says. If they would win our confidence, how much more convincing a great medical mission in India or Tibet than a million dollar temple in Chicago, beautiful as the Masrig U Askar may be. <laughs> W. M. Miller was a thinking man. The Baha'i Centenary, 1844 to 1944, published in 1944 by the Baha'i Publishing Company, Wilmette, Illinois, states that the superstructure was finished in 1931 and the exterior ornamentation was completed between 1932 and 1943. From the same source, we learn that four Baha'i schools have been established in the United States, some of which, judging from the photographs, are quite elaborate. Of the temple, this source states, records of daily visitors kept since July 1st, 1932, show that the total number who went through the building with Baha'i guides up to October 1st, 1943, was 164,360. To deal with that throng of inquirers, a body of temple guides has been rendering service, its members prepared by special course of instructions based upon long experience with the types of questions asked and the information desired, and it seems that the Mormons have learned something from this because they have instituted the exact same system. Now, it's evident to me, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, that a movement which so strongly stresses the unity of all religious forces in the world should be somewhat vague and general. For if they state anything exactly, then they are no longer unifying, are they? So there are not many points of Christian doctrine upon which this organization teaches, it rather ignores them one and all. Perhaps that's exactly where we should start in your 
basic education as to the tenets of Baha'ism. By now it should be clear that Baha'ism has some very fine points, which I read to you, which from the Christian standpoint make it all the more dangerous as a religion. The last three words that I gave you were stressed for a purpose. Who would not praise it in the Baha'is when they advocate world peace? Who would not praise any organization or any person when they advocate world peace? Who, listening, has not grasped by this time the terribleness of a universal war fought with modern weapons of wholesale destruction along the lines of World War II, which literally encompassed the globe? which would be fought, not in our interest, ladies and gentlemen, but in the interest of international investments of large capital. Rich people make money from wars, no matter who wins or loses. Who among you does not realize that modern warfare comes as close to hell as anything on earth can well come? Or who does not realize that it is more than a noble gesture For someone who has been a lifelong member of the Ku Klux Klan to lay a sick black child in the bed next to his own in the same ward and then tend to both with equal, equal tenderness. Do you think that it could ever happen? Do you think that it ever would? Because that's what they're talking about here. You see, there are great gifts of what Calvin called God's common grace. But all such nobility of character does not atone for sin, ladies and gentlemen. It is not religion. Least of all, is it a religion superior to Christianity, or to any other religion for that matter. It is a religion which vacillates and accepts basically the tenets, the main tenets of all, in order to be accepted by all, and their dream is that all will merge as one in Baha'i. You see, Baha'ism is plainly implied pantheism. Baha'ism is one more example of what Dr. Abraham Kuyper called many years ago the irresistible tendency in our age to change along every line the God-man into the man-God. As pantheism, Baha'ism stands condemned from the standpoint of Christianity, not man's reaching up to ever higher manifestations of the divine, but the transcendent God descending to man in divine revelation is the way out of human ills. You want to cause trouble upon this earth, you make man God and you will see more trouble than you ever dreamed of in your wildest fantasies or that you can read about in the most terrible history that has ever occurred in, the, in this world. You see, if man is God, he doesn't have to answer for anything. If man is God, he does not have to explain away his desires and temptations. If man is God, then he cannot sin by stealing what is yours, raping your wife, your daughter. Or murdering as many as he wishes. Without something higher than man, which man must answer to, there can be no morals. There can be no ethics. There can be no responsibility. That's the danger with all of this. Look around you. Who sitting around you would you trust to be God? Would you trust me to be God? 
By golly, I wouldn't. I know me too well. My teaching has always been not to place anyone upon a pedestal, not to follow blindly, not to trust anyone that you send to a public office, to listen to everyone, read everything, believe nothing unless you can prove it in your own research. You see, Baha'ism has much in common with theosophy. It grew, it grew literally out of the mystery religions, which is theosophy. And both emphasize the idea that one more divine spokesman must add to Jesus' words. But whereas theosophists are looking for this man to appear since Krishnamurti stepped down from the throne that was Christ's, in their words, Baha'is assert that this man has appeared already in Baha'u'llah. With theosophists, the Baha'is also agree that all religions are one. We remember Annie Besant's words, Blended together they give the whiteness of truth. Blended together they give a mighty cord of perfection. And this is due, of course, to their common pantheism. Baha'ism, ladies and gentlemen, has much in common with Spiritism and Freemasonry. For literally, at the highest levels, they are the same. At the highest levels, they are the same with the Mormon Church and many others. And I am only stating fact here, not condemning any of it. Of Spiritism, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote, To me, it is religion, the very essence of it. He called it, the great unifying force, the one probable thing connected with every religion, Christian or non-Christian, forming the common solid basis upon which each raises, if it must needs raise, that separate system which appeals to the varied types of mind. Well, that sounds exactly like Baha'ism, doesn't it? It does to me. The discussion of Freemasonry that we've had over the last four and a half years on this broadcast reveals that this is the same. Same old teaching, sort of twisted just a little bit to make it a little more likable and without an awful lot of the symbolism and the esoteric language which tends to scare people away. They're frightened by the unknown. To a great many Freemasons, the Lodge is the badge of sociability, mutual helpfulness, and especially the Blue Lodge, where they know nothing of the truth of the higher degrees. And they actually laugh at the idea that the Masonic Lodge or the Independent Order of Odd Fellows or the Rosa Cruci should be considered a competitor, let alone a substitute for the Christian religion. But indeed, in fact, it is. And nevertheless, many leaders of the Masonic movement, the officially recommended literature of the movement, its signs and emblems, which are all borrowed from Oriental pagan religions, all these and other things show Freemasonry to be such that one Dr. Tory was right when he said, a man can be a Christian and a Freemason, but he cannot be an intelligent Christian and an intelligent Freemason at the same time. For he's worshipping up on two altars. These altars to two different gods, and he knows it not. So without wanting to give offense, therefore, to Christian Masons, and I'm being <laughs> exceptionally polite tonight, because normally I'm not, I would ask of them to study such works as an encyclopedia of Freemasonry, which is in all the lodges, but seems to never be opened, and its kindred sciences, 
specific volume that I'm talking about, or set of volumes, was published in 1914. A Lexicon of Freemasonry, Masonic Ritualist, all by Albert G. Mackey, M.D., 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite. Freemasonry and the Ancient Gods by J.S.M. Ward, published in 1926. The New Odd Fellows Manual by Reverend A.B. Grosch, published in 1882. And I would ask Freemasons to consider why there is a co-Masonic order in the Theosophical Society. I would ask why the assertion that all religions are one should be tolerated in Freemasonry but condemned in Theosophy and Baha'ism. Baha'u'llah, in his last will and testament, said this, ladies and gentlemen, O ye people of the world, the religion of God is for the sake of love and union. Make it not the cause of enmity and conflict. The hope is cherished that the people of Baha shall ever turn to the blessed word. Lo, all are of God. Now, what's wrong with that? Absolutely nothing, ladies and gentlemen. It is something that any one of us, if we could put the words together, would say. The Supreme Council of the 33rd Degree of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry Southern Jurisdiction said this of the United States in 1874. Quote, Freemasonry is a worship but one in which all civilized men can unite, for it does not undertake to explain or dogmatically to settle those great mysteries that are above the feeble comprehension of our human intellect, end quote. You see, you thought I was joking when I said that they're the same. Exactly the same. Teaching exactly the same. Bringing about the same end result. And Mackey wrote, one of the great writers of Freemasonry, and I quote, If Freemasonry were simply a Christian institution, the Jew and the Moslem, the Brahmin and the Buddhist, could not conscientiously partake of its illumination. But its universality is its boast. In its language, citizens of every nation may converse. At its altar, men of all religions may kneel. To its creed, disciples of every faith may subscribe, end quote. So all you Masons out there who have been claiming that you are really a Christian brotherhood, you are lying to yourself, you are lying to your friends, to your families, and you're lying to me, and I don't let you get away with it, whereas all the rest of them might. Stop lying. Stop deceiving. Stop manipulating. If everybody would stop doing those things and start telling the truth, we could very quickly sort out where we're at in this world and where we're going and where we really want to be. And then we might actually be able to get there. Anyone who has to lie to make anyone else follow them is teaching a lie and following a lie and building a lie. Baha'is claim for their religion, a later emphasis upon the very same truth, they say, taught also among others by Christianity. We maintain... They say that it is, at least in its manifestation in Christian hands or lands, a sad imitation of the Christian religion. But it's not even close to an imitation of the Christian religion at all. And anyone who could confuse it for such doesn't know anything about Christianity. And you could not possibly confuse it for the Buddhist religion Are the Islamic religion? Are any of the 
Eastern religions, such as the Hindu religion. For it does not even come close to them either. Although it accepts and promotes parts of all of them. They believe the Baha'u'llah as the final manifestation of God in the flesh is an imitation of the incarnation as seen in Jesus Christ and in fact is the same spirit. Baha'i inspired tablets that we consider fake are their spiritual baptism Holy Land, Beatitudes, Unity Feast, the Lord's Supper, their imitation Pentecost, a surpassing peace is said to fill the souls of those who repeat 95 times daily the words Allah Ha Abha. These would be Christian touches apparently calculated to catch Christians, and it does not increase anyone's respect for Baha'ism. But it does actually occasionally catch somebody. That's that. Editorially, the Christian Century of September 25th, 1946, tells us that the Baha'is decided to begin to advertise their cause in a twofold manner for the rank and file through Newsweek and similar periodicals, while others were reached through trade journals of the publishing and broadcasting industries. And that's interesting. First, because we're now prepared to look for a more open method of propaganda, for you can begin to see their teachings increase and their advertising reach out even more as the New World Order struggles to be born. They teach the unity of any and all religions. Secondly, however, we can get a glimpse of the mentality of modernism when we see, ladies and gentlemen, their journal of religion go so far in their vehement antagonism against denominationalism and state that the plan is all right. The Baha'is have something to sell. It is interesting and may be helpfully suggested to other religious bodies to see how this worthy group, which had its origins among the Mohammedans of Persia about a century ago, makes use of the most modern techniques for making friends and influencing people. We'll continue this on Monday night. If you don't think it's worthwhile, turn off your radio and go to bed. I think it's worthwhile because it is, after all, the only approved religion of the United Nations. And that makes it extremely important. Good night, ladies and gentlemen, and God bless you all. You're listening to The Hour of the Time. I'm Pooh. And I'm William Cooper. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to continue tonight where I left off on uh, Friday night with the religion of Baha'i. The Baha'i faith, they call it, or Baha'ism. It is the only approved religion of the United Nations. It is the only religion recognized, for that matter, by the United Nations. And uh, if you want to know where we're going with this new world religion, you had better understand that what the United Nations recognizes is most probably going to have an awful lot to do with whatever world religion emerges from the birth of the world totalitarian socialist state. Baha'ism and the Bible. What, what is the difference between what Christians teach and uh, Mormons teach and the Baha'is teach and the 
Protestants teach and Catholics teach, or the Hindus or the Buddhists, you'll find that there's quite a bit. Baha'ism teaches the following, ladies and gentlemen, so listen very closely. The only God. They teach that their God is the only God. And there's the quote directly from their own literature. Further than this, man has no other point for concentration. He is God. Who is he? Baha'u'llah. They're previously and historically manifested, they say, God in the flesh, Baha'u'llah, their Messiah. According to sin, or having to do with sin, this is what they say. Listen carefully. The only difference between members of the human family is that of degree. Some are like children who are ignorant and must be educated until they arrive at maturity. Some are like the sick and must be treated with tenderness and care. None are bad or evil. We must not feel repelled by these poor children. We must treat them with great kindness, teaching the ignorant and tenderly nursing the sick. Abdul Labaha is the one who said that. And uh, here's another thing that he said. It's right out of their own literature. This, these are the tenets by which they practice their religion. Evil is imperfection. Sin is the state of man in the world of the baser nature. For in nature exist defects such as injustice, tyranny, hatred, hostility, strife. These are characteristics of the lower plane of nature. These are the sins of the world, the fruits of the tree from which Adam did eat. Through education we must free ourselves from these imperfections. And I can tell you ladies right now, ladies and gentlemen right now, that uh, what he said here is not true. For you will not find these things in nature unless man is present. If you don't believe me, look around. These things exist with the presence of man only. Injustice. You don't see injustice in nature. You don't see tyranny in nature. You don't see hatred in nature. You don't see hostility or strife in nature. You see the natural behavior for each animal according to its own nature. What they do, they do for survival. They do to eat. They do to protect their territory and their mate, or mates, as the case may be. Nature, without the presence of man, has a perfect and wonderful balance to it. And this religion is trying to say that evil is nature and it just is not true what about Baha'ism and Jesus here's what they say ladies and gentlemen I'm going to give you two different quotes from their literature and these are the, the main ones and the first is by Abdu Labaha, and he said, Christ was the prophet of the Christians, Moses of the Jews. Why should not the followers of each prophet recognize and honor the other prophets also? If men could only learn the lesson of mutual tolerance, understanding, and brotherly love, the unity of the world would soon be an established fact. What's wrong with that statement? Absolutely nothing. I tend to, uh, <laughs> I tend to believe that also, but only the last part. If men could only learn the lesson of mutual tolerance, understanding, and brotherly love, 
The unity of the world would soon be an established fact. I believe that. I don't know any intelligent person who would not believe that statement. Whether or not that statement can ever become reality, now that's another story, which is not the nature of man. <laughs> man has his own nature, just like the animals. The first part of his statement I totally disagree with. Christ was the prophet of the Christians, Moses of the Jews. Why should not the followers of each prophet recognize and honor the other prophets also? Because he's not just talking about Christ and Moses. He's talking about Buddha. He's talking about Nostradamus. He's talking about all of these people. Then, quite frankly, I can't accept all of those people. I can't even accept most of them, to tell you the truth. Faith versus reason. Listen to what they say about that. And you're going to recognize some buzzwords here that you've heard in the Mystery Babylon series and in a lot of the teachings that you've uh, listened to on this broadcast. Faith versus reason. Quote, there are two kinds of light. There is the visible light of the sun, spelled S-U-N, by whose aid we can discern the beauties of the world around us Without this, we could see nothing. Nevertheless, though, it is the function of this light to make things visible to us. It cannot give us the power to see them or to understand what their various charms may be. For this light has no intelligence, no consciousness. It is the light of the intellect which gives us knowledge and understanding. And without this light, the physical eyes would be useless. This light of the intellect is the highest light that exists, for it is born of the light divine. The light of the intellect enables us to understand and realize all that exists, but it is only the divine light that can give us sight for the invisible things and which enables us to see truths that will only be visible to the world thousands of years hence. We must not accept traditional dogmas that are contrary to reason nor pretend to believe doctrines which we cannot understand. To do so is superstition and not true religion. As to the sufferings of Christ, here's what they say about that. Why did Christ Jesus suffer the fearful death on the cross? Why did Mohammed bear persecutions? Why did the Bab make the supreme sacrifice? And why did Baha'u'llah pass the years of his life in prison? Why should all this suffering have been, if not to prove the everlasting life of the Spirit? Christ suffered. He accepted all his trials because of the immortality of his Spirit. If a man reflects, he will understand the spiritual significance of the law of progress, how all moves from the inferior to the superior degree. Abdullah Baha said that. And they also say, We hold that Baha'ism stands condemned by the following statements of Scripture. Or, excuse me. Matthew chapter 24, verses 24 through 26. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. If therefore they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, go not forth. Behold, he is in the inner chambers, believe it not. And in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, for it was the good pleasure of the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell, and through him to reconcile all things unto himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say whether things upon the earth or things in the heavens. And that's actually a quote from a Christian leader and his name is blurred here, 
And it is he that says, We hold that Baha'ism stands condemned by the following statements of Scripture. So you can see there, ladies and gentlemen, that there are quite a few reasons once you understand some of these religions or mystery teachings, you can see very clearly why certain things are happening. You can understand why your children are being taught certain principles. You can understand why you're seeing things on television that are being ingrained into the minds of the population. You can better understand the movies of the Walt Disney Studios throughout its history. For Walt Disney was not being kind to you or your children. Walt Disney was practicing a great deception. He was, in fact, teaching the mystery religion to the children. He was, in fact, ladies and gentlemen, setting the stage in the minds of the youth of his generation I mean the youth that were born and reared on the Walt Disney movies and stories for the New World Order. You notice that Friday night I played Disney music and tonight I'm playing it again. And you're going to find out <laughs> why I do that. Because now I'm going to talk about theosophy. And the United Nations may recognize Baha'ism is the only recognized religion. But i got to tell you that almost all of the New Age concepts come out of the melding of all of the mystery teachings and the hidden religion of the worship of the sun, going all the way back to ancient Babylon, into what is known as Theosophy, which was first taught by Madame Helena Blavatsky. And I've told you this many times before. This is where it's really at. This is where you really get the messages. This is where you really begin to understand what's happening and why. Theosophy is also known by its adherents as the divine wisdom. They believe it is the apostate child of spiritism. And some say that it's mixed with Buddhism. And if you don't know anything about the mystery religions, about the inner core and the highest degrees of Freemasonry, if you don't know anything about the ancient religions of Mithraeus, Arilusius, if you don't know about the ancient Egyptian worship of the sun, if you don't know about any of these things, if you don't know about Diana, if you don't know about Semiramis and Tammuz, if you don't know about Osiris and Isis and Horus, then this is exactly what you're going to think. You're going to think that it's a mixture of spiritism and some Far Eastern religion, but it's not really. It's a melding of all of the hidden and secret religions that have been practiced in dark chambers and groves at midnight and in tombs and in temples without windows for the whole history of the human race. It is a cosmogony. And I'm going to try to give you the most basic history and structure of worship and belief of this religion known as Theosophy, because this is really where it all is at. This is where you're going to find most of the answers that you're looking for if you're looking to find what is coming, what form it's going to take, what it means, And why? You see, theosophy is much more complicated than, than just spiritism mixed with Buddhism. It is extremely intricate. It is ancient. And at the same time, modern. 
It has a world and life view that is very complete. It is fascinating for those who study the occult. And for people who want an easy explanation for everything and want to be a part of uh, follow the crowd into the New World Order type thing, it is the religion. Before you can know anything about theosophy, ladies and gentlemen, you have to know a little bit about Helena Petrovna, who was a Russian girl. At the age of 17, she married a man in B. Blavatsky in 1848. She didn't stay with him very long. She deserted him after two months only and led a wandering life for over 25 years. She flitted between Paris, London, Russia, Greece, the United States, Mexico, and India. She became a spiritistic medium early in her life, and for ten years was under the control of a spirit, she says, who called himself John Keane. In 1857, ladies and gentlemen, Madame Blavatsky tried to found a spiritistic society at Cairo, Egypt, but failed. She then traveled to New York in 1873, and she sought cooperation with mediums. But just then, so much fraud was exposed that she wearied of the spiritism of the day. And in 1875, she founded the Theosophical Society in New York, aided by a man named Colonel Alcott, a colonel in the Civil War, and she said of it, and I quote, it is the same spiritualism but under another name, end quote. Well, it certainly wasn't, as you will soon discover. In 1882, Blavatsky and Alcott visited India together and rounded out their system of religion of theosophy by adding Hindu and Buddhist elements. You see, they took as they went along, much as the old Hebrew religion grew and changed and borrowed parts of the religion of the peoples of the country through which the nomadic tribes wandered. And when I say that about the heroes, I'm talking long before they ever established any kind of a kingdom or nation. For they were traditionally nomadic tribes, herdsmen. Blavatsky ultimately died in 1891, aged 60 years after a life of fame, infame, controversy, and a mystery. Her greatest successor, was a woman, Mrs. Annie Besant, born 1847, died 1933. She was the daughter of an English minister. What better person to move in and take the place of Helena Blavatsky because she had her own mysticism to add from the Christian religion. And she was later the wife of... of a man that she left in 1873. And after challenging the doctrine of the Church of England, Annie Besant identified herself with free thought and radical political movements. Then suddenly, Mrs. Besant was converted to theosophy. She pretended to become a scholar, and many claim that that was a, an accurate 
claim on her behalf. Others say that it was not. She was a public speaker, a very good public speaker, and she was a voluminous writer. She died on September 20th, 1933, in her 86th year. Annie Besant's outstanding claim was that her adopted son, Krishnamurti, also called Krishnaji, was the new Messiah, or the reincarnation of the world teacher. This she discovered on December 28, 1925, and in 1926, Baron Philippe van Palant gave his large estate at Omen in the Netherlands to be the headquarters of this new Messiah. Annual conferences were held, with at first as many as 2,000 attendant disciples, while in 1928 there were 1,750 women and 800 men. Some of these ladies slept with the picture of Krishnamurti under their pillows. At Crotona, California, the American headquarters of Theosophy, Krishnaji announced on November 20th, 1931, that he had become convinced he was not the Messiah and refused to receive further adoration, much to his great credit. This is what he said, quote, I am not an actor. I refuse to wear the robes of a Messiah, so I am again free of all possessions. I have nothing except my creed, end quote. Since then, he has lived in retirement, though giving lectures occasionally, up until the date of his death. Mrs. Besant died in 1933 and was succeeded by George S. Arendale, who upon his departure was followed by C. Jinarajadasa, and I have never been able to pronounce that name, spelled J-I-N-A-R-A-J-A-D-A-S-A, -A 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 -A. Jinara. Jadasa, who was the president of the society for many years since 1945. He was a prolific writer. Among his works are the Golden Books of the Theosophical Society, published upon the 50th anniversary of the Society at Adyar in 1925. Theosophy is called by L.W. Rogers, ladies and gentlemen, a religion, a philosophy, a science. But accurately speaking, none of these apply, for it is truly an attempt at all of them, and yet something way beyond them that fails miserably at blending science. And it can only be described in a brief outline unless you want to spend a whole lot of time and probably years studying the voluminous material which outlines the secret doctrine of the teachings of theosophy. We have those available, by the way, and you can refer to Veritas if you'd like to order the set of three volumes. Volume 3 was rare and extremely difficult to obtain until recently, and we have that available. We're going to look into Theosophy's complex ideas concerning God simply because the doctrine of God is always determinative for any system of religion. And therefore, that had better be the first thing that we look at. But I don't want to get into that until after this break. So don't go away, folks. I'll be right back. And if you're wondering why I'm speaking so slow Friday night and tonight... I've been having a tickling sensation in my throat, and if I talk fast, 
uh, pretty soon I begin coughing and then I can't talk at all. <laughs> That's why you're getting this slow, deliberate treatment. Well, ladies and gentlemen, did you know that Touchstone Pictures is Walt Disney? Do you know what Touchstone means? If you don't, I suggest that you uh, do a little research, because the answer to that question might uh, might tend to illuminate you a little bit further into the truth about the Walt Disney Corporation. The Hour of the Time is brought to you by Swiss America Trading. Swiss America Trading specializes in obtaining and making available to you any kind, from the lowest to the highest, from the most plentiful to the scarcest, precious metals in all of their different forms. Real money. When you get into gold and silver coin, it's real money. Coin of the realm. The money of account in the law. Constitutional money. It amazes me, ladies and gentlemen, that people don't understand that what they're carrying in their wallets every day is worthless. Its value depends upon the ability of the Federal Reserve to convince you that it has some kind of worth. And of course it doesn't. And since we're in a debt-based economy, the amount of money in circulation has to continually increase as the population increases and as more and more people take out loans, create debt. And so a constant and continuing inflation occurs. Everybody thinks they're better off today than they were in 1954, but I can assure you that's not true. If you go back and look what people made in 1954 and what they could buy with what they made and look at what you make now and compare it with what you can buy with what you make now, you'll find out that you're not better off at all. And you also have to understand that back in 1954, ladies and gentlemen, only one person in the family had to work to make a decent living for the entire family. Think about that. It's because we are using a worthless paper that is not money, it is not a note, and it is not currency according to any legal definition that you can find. And if you don't believe that, you look up those definitions in Black's Law Dictionary, or any other law dictionary for that matter. And also, if you look on the new money that has just come out, you'll see that Federal Reserve System replaces the old wording. Yet, if you call the Federal Reserve, or if you check into the law, you'll find that there is no legal term covering anything called Federal Reserve System. All Swiss America trading, get your hands on some real money. It's all going to come tumbling down very soon. It has to. That's one of the planks of the Communist Manifesto, which is running the show, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't believe it, take a copy of the Communist Manifesto. Compare America of 20 years ago to America today, and you'll see that almost all of the planks of the Communist Manifesto, as written by Marx and Engels, have been implemented already. 1 800 289 2646. That's 1 800 289 2646. And do it now. You know how you are. Think of a wonderful thought, <laughs> and you can fly. Well, that seems to be the way the world is going today. Just think of a wonderful thought. If it feels good, do it. Everything is a learning experience. 
So what if you hurt somebody else? You learn something by it, right? In theosophy, like its prototype, the Eastern religions, into which Lovatsky melded all of this stuff, and which was originally a reaction against the polytheism of India, and I'm speaking of Buddhism, is remarkably silent and evasive in its statements concerning God. And if you have ever studied Buddhism, you'll quickly discover why that is. Because Buddhism was not a religion. Buddha was not teaching a religion. Buddha was the son of a ruler, a wealthy, educated boy. But he saw the misery and the suffering and the poverty of the people of India. And he decided to try to do something about it. What he taught was the way of life, which is followed by the extreme poor and suffering would enable them to be more comfortable and happier with their lot. It did not teach them to rise above that condition, and it taught them nothing about God. It taught them a way of life. And that's why Buddhism is silent. That's why it's evasive. That's why it doesn't talk about God. It is, if you really want to know the truth, pantheistic since Buddha. He didn't teach that. And now it teaches an impersonal God and some Buddhists actually revere Buddha himself and his statues so much that many people think that Buddha is their God. And that's not true either. Buddhism teaches God is all and all is God. Over and over again, theosophic writers speak of the unity of all life. And you hear that in the New Age and in all these New World people. It takes a village. <laughs> From this principle considered fundamental, follow many other doctrines. If everything that is is God, and this God is thought of as universal life, the limitless consciousness, if you will, the eternal love, if you will, the very source and heart of all that is, it soon follows that every form of activity is conceived of as wave after wave of this life pushing its way up through matter. Everything is God. Man is God. Hillary Clinton is God. Given this, we don't uh, marvel that all religions are esteemed fundamentally one by these people. Again, same principle as Baha'is. There may be a, a, a different dogma, a different emphasis, a different teaching. The brotherhood of religions is the first plank in the platform of the Theosophical Society. Everything is brotherhood. And that comes right out of the mysteries. At some point in her life, Elena Petrovna Blavatsky rose to the heights to become an initiate, an adept, a priest in the mystery religion of Babylon. There's no doubt about it. And we have found the record of her initiation into the Masonic Lodge. So we know that she was a Freemason. She said, every religion has a note of its own, a color of its own, that it gives for the helping of the world. Blended together, they give the whiteness of truth. Blended together, they give a mighty chord of perfection. The last was a quote from Basant. This impersonal God, from which they say all religions emanate, when occasionally described, is spoken of as a trinity, 
But it's a trinity with theosophy in name only, folks, for it's a threefold manifestation of power, our will, wisdom, and activity. To quote Mrs. Bassanet, and I used to teach in my lectures, the best way to understand it was to draw a triangle on a bulletin board and write, write thought, desire, action. That's why you see so many triangles. It represents the trinity of the God of the New World Religion. That's where it comes from. Thought, desire, action, will, wisdom, activity. Same thing. Elsewhere she expresses this thought as follows. Quote, Trinity of divine beings, one is God, three is manifested powers. End quote. Worse than this, we are told there is a fourth person, or in some religions, a second trinity, feminine, the mother. And this is that which makes manifestation possible, that which eternally in the one is the root of limitation and division, and which when manifested is called matter. It is the triangle below the triangle, the pyramid below the pyramid. It is what is known as And you're not going to believe this, but the name just slipped my tongue, just slipped right out of my mouth and disappeared faster than I could say it. <laughs> but I will remember it sometime during this broadcast or the next. You've heard of As Above, So Below. Everything... opposes the duality of this world. In other words, their God is not a male God as the Christian God is. It is a androgynous God, possessing both female and male. This, they believe, is the... <laughs> Some of it is uh, so far out that it's hard for me to even tell you about it, folks. Some of... Some of it is very difficult to understand, and, and you shouldn't even try unless you want to follow this religion. They believe that this is the divine not-self, the divine matter, the manifested nature, regarded as one, which later on becomes she, as triple, she is the fourth, making possible the activity of the three, the field of their operations by virtue of her infinite divisibility, at once the handmaid of the Lord and also his mother, yielding of her substance to form his body, the universe, when overshadowed by his power. You see, I told you this was a very intricate religion. So let me give you one more taste of this, one that you might understand a little bit better. The second person is revealed by interaction between her, the divine matter, and the third person of the Trinity, and thus becomes the mediator. Hence, the second person of the Trinity of Spirit is ever dual. He is the one who clothes himself in matter in whom the twin halves of deity appear in union, not as one. And I know that you're all thoroughly confused. I hope that it will become clear as we go along. But this, if you understand it, suffices to show that the theosophic conception of the Godhead is very different from that held in the Holy Catholic Christian Church or in the Protestant Church. It is impersonal. It lies at the root of all existence. It manifests itself as power, as wisdom, and as activity, as thought, as desire, and action. When, and only when, it's considered as a spiritual entity, 
it also manifests itself as divine matter, which is the necessary condition for its manifestation. The second person, wisdom, is dual in nature, spiritual as reason, material as love. The cosmogony that I spoke about earlier comes about in this manner. Theosophy, considering matter eternal, believes the cycles of the universe by the millions and reckons them also as such. They believe that we are at present in the fifth subrace of the human root race. And even a subrace goes on for millennia without any visible changes preparing for a new subrace, which makes its appearance suddenly. They say that in the new age, the new age of Aquarius, the new world order, the fifth root race will disappear and the sixth root race will emerge. The present subrace called the Teutonic is a subrace of the Aryan root race. Remember, I told you this is all racial and religious in nature, ladies and gentlemen. And they believe that the Anglo Aryan race is a superior race, that all the other races are inferior, being guided in their developmental evolution by this superior race. And if they find races that they believe cannot evolve properly, they destroy that race, get rid of it. They believe that the Aryan root race was preceded by the Atlantean, and this in turn by the Lemurian race. Remember all those terms that you already heard in all of these other things, and in the Baha'i religion also, and in the Rose and Cross? They believe that the Lemurian race was the first that can be truly called human, as it was preceded by semi-animal races, monkeys, if you will. The proper history of man, according to Blavatsky, began no less than 18 million years ago. As a result of her clairvoyant investigation, for she claimed to be a medium who could talk to the spirits and see into the other world. She was in contact, she claims, with divas and mahatmas, terms and titles that she got from her travels through India. As a result of her clairvoyant investigations, the theosophists published maps of the world as it was 800,000 years ago, and again as it appeared 11,500 years ago. And you're beginning to see in the New Age movement maps that are depicting the world as it will appear after these earth changes that will destroy the fifth root race and leave the sixth root race as the inheritor of the world. And what do you think that's all about, ladies and gentlemen? They talk very clearly that those who cannot make the shift in collective consciousness will not be allowed into the new world. You better listen to these people because they're telling you that if you don't accept what they're teaching, you're going to be destroyed, murdered, if you will. And I mean it, murdered. They may use you as slave labor for a while, but they're surely going to kill you eventually. And they make no secret of it. None whatsoever. They tell us of the Atlantean race living on the Atlantean continent 800,000 years ago. They believe that this continent formed a belt around the earth stretching almost uninterruptedly from Mexico right across the present Atlantic Ocean onto Egypt and Asia, and that the similarity in the pyramids that exist in these countries is proof of this. They believe in an older continent, the Lemurian, 
once stretched from the Indian Ocean to Australia, from the same occult source of information, theosophists know that during the Atlantean period, very early immigrations resulted in the grand civilization of Egypt, which was in progress long before the time assumed by modern historians. And some Jewish scholars believe that they are the survivors of this ancient religion. And I don't know if they're in the minority or the majority. I really don't know. Other so-called Aryan, other so-called Aryan scholars claim that they are the survivors and the true inheritors of the intelligence and the civilization of these previous root races and, and worlds, if you will. And uh, this scholar believes that they're all full of crap and it's all a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> And I can prove my statement much easier than they can ever prove theirs. And if it's true that every age the old race dies and the new race emerges and takes control, then what they are really saying is that they are the old devolved race. That they really don't belong here. If they believe their own crap. <laughs> That's what they're saying. They're saying that they're really inferior. And they don't even understand that. Because they say that those civilizations were wiped out by a superior evolutionary jump in the progression of the human race. And that is true. And they're claiming they're the survivors and that they're descended from these ancient races and civilizations and what they're saying is they are inferior. Truly. But they claim to be superior. Now you figure that out, folks. Because I'll tell you, no matter how I look at it, none of it makes any sense at all. It doesn't pass even the most basic of common sense tests. If the human race is truly evolving, you certainly don't want to be part of an old race, do you? I mean, if you believe all that stuff. Me, I just believe in the human race, and I don't care one lick about any of it. Of this early civilization, we know that very little is left beyond the pyramids, and they attribute this to the great convulsions, which they say took place 11,005 years ago. They believe at that time of the Atlantean continent, only an island was left about as large as all modern Europe minus Russia. And due to the cataclysm, this island subsided with terrific suddenness. And the sea, which then covered what is now the desert of Sahara, was driven eastward so as to completely deluge Egypt. And in support of this so-called clairvoyant assertion, for they can't prove it in any other way, a Mexican document is proudly pointed to, which has been translated in 1893. They say it is in itself an ancient manuscript of immense antiquity, and it says, they say, that the catastrophe took place 8,060 years before the writing of the Bible. Ten countries, it says, were torn asunder in the convulsion and sank with their 64 million inhabitants. And we'll continue this tomorrow night. And no, ladies and gentlemen, the tickle in my throat, for those of you who are trying to guess, is not cancer or anything terrible. I have a sinus condition. When my sinuses are acting up, I can't breathe through my nose at night. I have to breathe through my mouth. My throat gets incredibly dry. It causes me all kinds of problems, and that's all it is. Good night. Again, 
God bless you all.